Okay, hello everyone. Thank you all for coming back for panel two, Technological Innovation in Asia, part two. We're thrilled to have Dr. Anna Stir, the director of the University of Hawaii at Manoa Center for South Asian Studies as the moderator for this panel. So we will start off with Dr. Stir introducing the panelists. Dr. Stir. Thank you, Tasha. It's a delight to be here for this panel. Um, our first, pan so this panel, is technological in, in technological innovation in Asia part two. And our first panelist this time is going to be Lillian McIntyre from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And her panel, her paper title is Interpreting the Inaka, Locality in Shin Megami Tensei, Persona. Okay, I guess that's my cue. Yes, it is. Lillian, All right. I'll go ahead and take it away then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I was just briefly introduced, but yep, I'm Lillian McIntyre. I'm a first year master's degree student here at our Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, my specialization is actually in Japanese literature, um, specifically digital literatures. So today I'll be presenting on something in that vein, right? Um, the 2008 video game Shin Megami Tensei Persona 4. The Inaka is the Japanese countryside, so I'll be looking at the way that the countryside is represented and reconstructed within this game, specifically, oh, specifically through the use of social mechanics, and also by looking at the epilogue of the 2012 re-release, Persona 4 Golden. Um, so let's go ahead and get started by situating this video game kind of within a broader conversation, um, the representations of the countryside within Japanese literature. Um, very commonly, the countryside is tied to the idea of a birthplace or a hometown. Um, it's a trope that's kind of been around since 1890. Um, and it's prominent enough that the Japanese literary critic Kobayashi Hideo wrote about it in 1933 in his essay, Literature of the Lost Home. In it, he draws a connection between his being born in the city in Tokyo with being unable to really understand what a home is, um, therefore kind of drawing that connection again between the country and the home. We see this theme also in other, the other works of other major authors at the time, um, from Kunikira Dopo to Shimazaki Toson and Shiga Naoya. Um, and we also see it in the contemporary posthumous boom in popularity of Miyazawa Kenji's work. So um, we'll be looking at that, of course, within a piece of literature that's a little bit more contemporary and perhaps in a medium that's a little bit different from the archetypical novel. Um, so I'll be, we'll be looking at Persona 4, which is the fourth first game in the popular Persona offshoot of the older Shin Megami Tensei series of games. It brings its protagonist to a remote, um, socially and economically removed provincial town by the name of Inaba. Um, this is a fictional city. Um, these are a couple of the establishing shots of the town. And Persona 4 is very unique in that within the larger series, it's the only game that is set in this kind of rural area. Um, all the other games in the Shin Megami Tensei series are set in cities. Um, either fictional or very directly and closely based on Tokyo. And Inaba is introduced to us, um, the player, at the same time that the protagonist is. Um, at the very opening of the game, our protagonist boards a train in a city, um, very brightly lit, um, and he rides the train all the way to Inaba. Um, when he steps out of the station, it's under a dark gray sky, and we can tell immediately maybe from just the color palette alone, that Inaba might not be quite as lively or active as the city is. One of the first people that we meet in Inaba is a gas station attendant um, who quips, does not surprise a city boy to see how little there is out here? And there's so little to do, I'm sure you'll get bored fast. At the protagonist's first day of school, when he's walking home, he walks past some rice paddies. Um, there's no big malls or shopping centers in sight here in Inaba. And his new friends kind of comment on it as well, right? There really is nothing here, huh? And when they think about what maybe could be attractive to someone from the city about the town, they have trouble thinking of what it could be. Um, maybe their dyed clothes or pottery or something is famous, they think. Um, and a local traditional inn is brought up as being what pretty much keeps the town going. Then to make matters worse, in the first few weeks of the game, a pervasive fog falls upon the town and dead bodies are discovered strung up in high unnatural places. So on top of being isolated, there is a serial killer loose in Inaba. Clearly, this is not a very exciting move. Um, 
And it's something that maybe seems a little bit different from the idealized hometowns that I mentioned before. Um, and in fact, by the end of the game, Persona 4 does transform into one of these idyllic hometowns. So what we'll be looking at from this point on is how this process happens. Um, and I argue that Persona 4 leverages its social mechanics to enact this transformation. Um, one aspect of Persona 4 that is commonly cited by critics is the incorporation of marginalized characters, um, characters who deal with um, stereotypes of gender and characters who deal with their sexualities. Um, this is one of these characters. Um, this is Kanji Tatsumi. He appears to be a bit of a rowdy punk, right, from his earrings and his nose piercing. Um, but in actuality, he works diligently at sewing and textile work so that he can take over his mother's business. Um, his character arc revolves around his struggle with kind of stereotypes around masculinity, but also how those stereotypes kind of map onto homosexuality um, and his own kind of attraction to men. Additionally, there's this character, Naoto Shirogane, who is a young woman who works as a detective. Um, she presents herself as male, however, due to the societal gender pressures surrounding her job. Um, these two characters are paired together through Kanji's initial attraction to Naoto, um, notably before she's revealed to be a woman. And after this aspect of her identity is unmasked, he continues to be kind of flustered around her and blushes in her presence. New media scholar Thomas Lamar reads this as a situation that oscillates between reinforcing heteronormative ideas about couples, as well as allowing for alternative ways of pairing. So aside from the way these characters are marginalized and the queerness of their identities and their relationship, Lamar also notes the way that personal power is not associated with personal sovereignty within the game. Um, he positions the group ties in Persona 4 as running counter to the traditional Freudian paradigm of sovereign enclosure, arguing that the acceptance of vulnerability and the reliance on others as depicted in the game runs counter to the commonly held dichotomy between being vulnerable and being powerful. Or more simply put, within the universe of Persona 4, vulnerability is not weakness. I read this as an extension of the querying that comes from the relationship between the characters of Kanji and Naoto. The bonds that form between the main circle of seven friends can be considered queer because their narratives really involve this um, kind of opening up and this revealing of vulnerable parts of their identities. Um, within the narrative, the story of the game, they have to encounter their alternate selves in an alternate world, and they do so with their friends, therefore revealing these unsightly parts of themselves. This is similar to the paradigm of queerness that Jack Halbert's Tim offers us in In a Queer Time and Place. So one that is not equated with sexuality, but one that rather invokes running contrary to the social norm. This queerness and the invocation of marginality lends not only a facsimile of realism to the game's characters, but also works to neutralize one of the common denigrations of the countryside, that of the image of the countryside as backwards or potentially intolerant of identities that deviate from the norm. We can see further countering of negative countryside stereotypes in other members of the cast as well. Um, this is Yosuke Hanamura. Um, he's one of the first characters introduced in the story of Persona 4. And what's notable about him is that he's also a city transplant. Although he's moved to the city a couple of months before the protagonist, um, he's not super well adapted yet. Um, he's the son of the manager of Junez, the town's first big box store, which has destroyed profits for local businesses think something like Walmart, right? And due to this, he's resented by many in the town and he has trouble really getting along socially. When he's forced to confront his alternate self in the TV world, um, this other Yosuke taunts him with his need for companionship, but also his hate for Inaba. He exclaims, you're sick of everything, especially living out in the sticks. And he even goes so far as to refer to Inaba as a shithole. Um, Yosuke is ashamed of these feelings, but he acknowledges that he does have them. And later he interprets them as being kind of a, ref of a reflection of his inability to adapt to the new situation. But Yosuke does turn around on Inaba. By the end of the game, he even says that he loves it. And the value that he finds in the countryside are the vulnerable queer bonds that he's able to form. Um, when he lived in the city, he says that he mostly made small talk with the friends around him and he wasn't really able to talk about any serious issues, something that's changed now that he's here and he's forming these friendships with the main cast. It's only when Yosuke finds himself in the countryside that he can be his real self around his acquaintances and that he has the potential to be queer. 
So as he stresses the importance of the connection he formed in this space and his own change, he participates in constructing Inaba as a place that alters the self and provides a setting for authentic connection, invoking an idealization of the countryside as a place where community is more easily formed. We see a very similar arc in the character of Rise Kujikawa. She's a teenage idol who receives invasive attention from the press, and she moves in with her grandmother in Inaba so that she can reclaim some sense of a normal life. Similarly to Yosuke, um, she also had few friends in the city. She says she was bullied at school before she made her debut as an idol, um, but when she came back to school, she suddenly became popular, but was dismayed that it felt like nobody really wanted to be friends with her, just her idol persona. So she appreciates the connections and the friendships that she's only been able to form once she moves to Inaba. And she says that she feels like she's finally been able to relax. Um, she also cites the nature of the town. Um, she says, when she listens to say the song of the birds or the bubbling of streams, um, it's something that really helps her to calm down. Um, further emphasizing this dichotomy between city and country. Um, these things that she's listing are portrayed as being impossible for her to attain within the city. And this dichotomy between city and country is something that is continually brought up throughout the game. Um, perhaps most notably and most evident in the way the game is bookended by two sweeping spatial shifts. At the beginning of the game, the protagonist moves from the city to the countryside. And then at the end of the game, the protagonist must then leave the country to return to the city, as he's only come to Inaba to spend, spend one year while his parents work abroad. It's the return of the protagonist to the city that cements Inaba as a furusato, a place of origin, a potential home, or a second home. As this act of leaving transforms it into a place that the protagonist must return to rather than take up permanent residence in. By ending the game through this departure, Persona 4 situates Inaba as a nostalgic area that will remain in the protagonist and the player's past, thereby mythologizing this country town's otherness from the urban sphere. However, in the follow-up to Persona 4, um, Persona 4 Golden, released in 2012, um, this is not quite where the game ends. Um, Persona 4 Golden underwent production during 2011, the year of the triple disaster, so named for the tsunami, earthquake, and nuclear meltdown that devastated rural northern regions of Japan. Um, Golden alters certain details of the setting, and it adds an additional epilogue to the story. Um, what's most significant about this epilogue is how it enacts a third spatial move from city to country. We get to see the protagonist return back to this um, now kind of considered hometown. Around the 2011 triple disaster, one of the predominant narratives that surrounded the event was that of national bonding, a kind of coming together to help the afflicted region. The word kizuna, or human connections, became strongly associated with the event, picked up by politicians, as prolific as Japan's prime minister at the time, and voted to be the kanji of the year. When our protagonist first steps out of the train station in Inaba, the first thing that he's confronted with is a politician who's giving a speech that sounds remarkably similar to some of this discourse. He says things like, I want to join hands with all of you to rethink this town's future. And if we can all work together on this, this town will regain its former glory. At the end of the original Persona 4, Inaba has returned to being a sleepy Hamlet um, after the resolution of the serial murders that kind of haunt the first year of the game. Um, but the future Inaba that's portrayed as golden is actually a town that's invigorated to recreate itself. The quiet shopping district that is presented at the beginning of the game is now surrounded by red and yellow banners all advertising local goods. And we see shopkeepers chatting about what they can sell as a meibutsu, or kind of a regional specialty. This is really reminiscent of a trend that is identified as furusato zukuri, machi zukuri, or chiki zukuri, so native place making, town making, or locality making. And in the wake of the 2011 disaster, I propose that these shifts in the ending of Golden may also reflect the reconstruction efforts in Tohoku. Um, this need for economic revitalization is prompted by the resolution of a disaster, um, one that's caused partly by human hands. Um, in Inaba's case, a serial murder, whereas in Fukushima's case, the power plant meltdown. Um, and I think that this ending of Golden can be interpreted as an allegorical image of a similarly marginalized Tohoku coming back to life after a similar disaster. The very ending of Persona 4 Golden comes back to kind of cement this image of Inaba as a hometown. Um, it's really a scene of domestic delight. The protagonist returns to his uncle's home at last um, and his young cousin 
enthusiastically refers to him as big brother, um, indicating this kind of tight familiar bond that has formed between them. All of the protagonist's friends have new outfits and hairstyles, indicating their growth from the events of the year prior, um, and they're all very excited and happy to see each other again. Finally, over a toast, they call it a homecoming greeting, okayuri nasai, or in English, welcome back or welcome home. So to briefly conclude, we've now seen how Persona 4 creates the space of Inabas through the characters who live in it and the movements around it, and how Persona 4 Golden uses these themes of kind of uh, human bonding to create a different image of an idealized countryside in kind of the context of disaster recovery. By recontextualizing Persona 4 with Japanese literary history in this way, we can see the ongoing influence of these constructions of the countryside today, no matter what medium they're used in. Um, so I'll be wrapping it up about here, but thank you very much for your time. Um, I'd be happy later to go back to any slides you may have questions about. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Are there any quick questions? Yes, nice to see all of those applause icons. Okay, so if there are no quick questions, um, please do save your longer questions until the end of our time. And we'll move on to our second presenter in this panel who is Frio Ramadan Supratman from Paramadina University in Jakarta. And he is presenting on Cold War Order and Technology Development in Indonesia. So please go ahead with your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you very much for having me. My name is Priya Ramadan Supratman from Prambandina University, Indonesia. I would like to present my article entitled Cold War Order and Technology Development in Indonesia. This article uh, observes uh, history of Cold War and technology development in Indonesia uh, in 1950-1989 and analyze how Cold War Order and Indonesian independent and active foreign policy gave significant impact on technology development in Indonesia. According to the background, I examine how did Cold War order influence technology development in Indonesia? How did Indonesia apply independent and active foreign policy for technology development? Uh, the number of studies about Cold War has paid great attention on various perspectives. However, studies regarding technology development in Indonesia has been written by, by some scholars. Sulfikar Amir, for instance, writes an article regarding how the impact of nationalist rhetoric and technology development in Indonesia. Uh, Amir argues that technological nationalism works as a form of ideology to create a shared feeling of national identity and pride through technological artifacts. In this article, I emphasize on technology development in the context of Cold War order and I place technology development in Indonesia in the context of international system. Uh, Cold War order was an international system dominated by USA and USSR as two great powers in the world. In addition, uh, the, the order was a part of realist order as there are two or more dominant big powers that have little choice but to act according to realist dictates and engage in security competition with each other. John Mersheimer emphasizes that if world order become realist, then ideological considerations are subordinated to security considerations in these circumstances. Therefore, Cold War, Cold War order emphasizes on security approach, not on ideological approach. During Cold War order, uh, during Cold War until today, Indonesia embraced principle of independent and active foreign policy. Ba the background of the policy was the importance of Indonesian position against imperialism and colonialism, prioritizing independence and self-determination for colonized countries. <clears throat> According to Vice President Muhammad Hatta, 1945-1956, the principle of independence and active was uh, said by Indonesian government on 2 September 1948. Have the Indonesian people fighting for their freedom, no other course of action open to them than to
to choose between being pro-Russian or pro-American? Is there no other position that can be taken in the pursuit of our national ideals? The Indonesian government is of opinion that the position to be taken is that Indonesia should not be a passive party in the area of international politics, but that it should be an active agent entitled to decide its own standpoint. The policy of the Republic of Indonesia must be resolved in the light of its own interests and should be executed in consonance with the situations and facts it has to face. The lens of Indonesia's policy cannot be determined by bent of the policy of some other country which has its own interest to surface. Muhammad Hatta also said that independent and active principle did not mean that Indonesia avoided every foreign aid, but Indonesia is prepared to receive intellectual, material, and moral assistance from any country whatsoever, provided there is no lessening or, or threat to her independence and sovereignty. Uh, story of uh, uh, story of Cold War is not only about the rivalry between USA and USSR, but also regarding the third world countries' attempts to prioritize development. Indonesian philosopher and writer Sutan Takdir Ali Shahbana said that Indonesia lack of professional officers and engineers. Many of the uh, Sutan Takdir said many of the present difficulties are undoubted, undoubtedly due to lack of experience and trained personnel, but in the business world and in government, and this has resulted in much uneven and indecisive action. Among a population of 80 million, Indonesia has only about 1,000 physicians, 300 lawyers, 80 fully qualified engineers, and 10 economists to cope with all its various problems. In 1950s, Indonesia was in early, early stage of development so that it in Indonesia intensified several endeavors to build economy, science, and technology. In the field of science and technology, Indonesia had uh, two universities at the time in, in 1950s, uh, University of Indonesia and University of uh, Gajah Mada. Facu Faculty of Engineering UI or FTUI Bandu in Bandung was the best science and technology education center in Indonesia. The school was a successor of Technische Hoe School, THS founded by Dutch colonial administration in 1920s. In 1950s, Indonesia benefited from Cold War order and the rivalry between USA and USSR in science and technological innovation. Therefore, Indonesia kept building relations with other countries to develop technology. Furthermore, in the middle of the conflict between Indonesia and Netherlands, both countries keep continuing to build relations in order to develop technology. In 1950, Indonesian Minister of Education, Abu Hanifa, for example, visited Netherlands to look for engineers or technical experts. According to Abu Hanifa, I come here in order to look for technical experts for university and middle schools. Uh, this, uh, despite of development, the colonization was another discourse that Indonesian statement always taught until 1960s. Nationalism and anti-imperialism had strong relations with technology development during guided democracy era. The opening of Bandung Institute of Technology, or ITB, attended by President Sukarno and leaders uh, of Vietnam's communist Ho Chi Minh, marked a link between technology and imperialism. As a leader of co a communist group in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh had, had, anti, had certainly anti-imperialism and anti-Americanism visions. In the opening of ITB, Ho Chi Minh gave a speech calling for long life Bandung spirit. It marked that technology would be built in it ITB should grow Bandung spirit, uh, initiated in Bandung Conference 90, 1955. Meanwhile, Sukarno interpreted technology development through ITB would aim to create prosperous society by supplying enough food, many clothes, and houses with radio, television, and electricity. The paradox of decolonization was seen when Indonesia should build relations with USSR and USA in 1960s. On one side, Indonesia emphasized on independence on technology field. However, uh, on another side, Indonesia could not avoid cooperation with other countries, especially USSR. In this sense, as a developing country, Indonesia could not avoid influence of great powers. However, the close relation between Indonesia and USSR in 1960s 
was still an embodiment of independence and active foreign policy because the relation was addressed to Indonesian national interests. Furthermore, thanks to the cooperation, USSR planned to give atom reactor to Indonesia. The Dean of University of Pajajaran at the time, Dr. Mustopo, said that University of Pajajaran had a nuclear study center. He was even optimist that Bandung City could be center of scientific research in the field of atom power for peace purpose. As a successor of, Suka, uh, of President Soekarno, Suharto, President Soeharto, uh, although still embraced independent and active foreign policy, built more close relations with Western countries. The rest of Suharto marked new era named New Order that abandoned rhetoric of anti-imperialism and anti capitalism during guide democracy era. He focused more on uh, economic development rather than voicing political rhetoric abroad. Suharto abandoned rhetoric of decolonization, focusing on low profile political style and economic stability. Accordingly, nationalist, national interest new order era, new order era was defined as economic interest. In building a strong economic stability, President Suharto was helped by technocrat and technologist group. The technologist group consisted of uh, Indonesian engineers, which were led by Baharudin Yusuf Habibi, uh, who got PhD degree in aeronautics engineering from Technische Hochschule Aachen, Germany. New order government emphasis on the importance of economic stability. Therefore, technology development was prioritized to improve economic stability. Technology development, says Habibi, should be executed should be executed to create added value. Habibi concludes that the core of production as economic activity is adding value to raw material component or anything from early material from that process. Habibi's thought who integrates technology-based added value into economic development known as Habibinomics. In short, Habibinomics rejects the excessive focus on lowering production costs through the use of cheap labor. In order to support technology development and industrialization, Habibi formed two pivotal institutions which developed technology in Indonesia during New Order era, uh, namely IPTN or Aircraft National Industry. As the, uh, as the industry, I, IPTN was a breakthrough in the field of technology. The industry was up, opened officially by President Suharto on 23 August 1976. In the context of Cold War, technology vision of Habibi was important to avoid dependency on developed countries. However, the technology development in Indonesia did not mean that it, Indonesia was isolated from international forum. In building technology, Indonesia still built cooperation with relatively prosperous uh, Western countries such as USA and Western European countries. Uh, uh, in this paper, uh, I argue uh, that princ principle of an independent and active foreign policy was an important factor on developing technology in Indonesia during Cold War. Through the principle, Indonesia could cooperate with various countries benefiting from technology innovation of great powers and developed countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Friel, for your presentation. Um, are there any quick clarifying questions after this one? No? Okay. Well, we will move right along. Thank you to everybody so far for sticking to schedule so well. That's really wonderful. We're moving along very smoothly. Our next presenter is Jake Atienza from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and his presentation is titled Documenting the Invisible, Mining as a Process of Institutional Violence. Welcome, Jake. Uh, just making sure that everybody can see my screen. Okay. So uh, like you said, my name is Jake Atienza. I'm a master's student at the sociology department at the University of Hawaii. Uh, the title of my presentation is Documenting the Invisible, Mining as a Process of Institutional Violence. Uh, this is part of an ongoing project. 
so today I will provide an overview of my research, including a case study, some of my theoretical framing, and then I will discuss uh, some samples of my source materials. So to start off, uh, my research centers around a deadly 2018 landslide at Apo Lands Mine on the island of Cebu in the Philippines. I compare primary interviews and video documentation for my field work I conducted in 2019 and a court document that I obtained from a law firm representing mining affected residents. Um, so I am interested in types of violence that are implicit or invisible. Uh, so invisible violence is not documented in my photographs and videos of the mine, but it is apparent in my interviews uh, with mining affected residents and the ways that certain types of lived experiences are in included while others are excluded from court documents. I, I argue that the judicial bureaucracy perpetuates violence against people who have already experienced a material form of violence from mining activities through death and dispossession, specifically in the case of Naga in Cebu. Um, so the case study is um, when uh, the landslide happened at Apo Cement Quarry in Naga City, it resulted in 29 deaths, 57 people were missing, and over 8,000 people were affected in six barangays or towns. Uh, the families of victims and other affected residents then filed a lawsuit uh, against the involved mining corporations and local and provincial government actors, uh, but their lawsuit was unsuccessful. A year after the landslide, the Regional Trial Court of Cebu decided in favor of the defendants, ruling that it did not meet the criteria to be considered a lawsuit or a class action lawsuit. Existing scholarship on this specific case uh, mostly focuses on the geospatial features of the landslide. So these are basically uh, focusing on the movement of mass aggregate material and its impact. Um, a Historical perspective helps situate uh, violence of mining in Naga City within the emergence of capitalism in the Philippines. So the emergence of, of the Philippine mining sector can be traced back to the U.S. colonial rule and to the U.S. regime of monopolistic capitalism that followed it. Uh, both Karl Marx's primitive accumulation and David Harvey's accumulation by dispossession are helpful in centering processes involving economy, labor, uh, and land that are supported uh, and promoted by the state, the Philippine state. So capitalism's geographical dimension illustrates a particular logic of power, which continuously engages in a process of territorial configuration. So this logic operates on the premise that territories should be continuously opened up rather than restrained from capitalist development. So for capitalism to succeed, basically, this type of spatial violence is a necessary cost requiring the backing of state powers. So following this Marxist discourse on material harm or conditions, I conceptualize my arguments based on a dialectical framework on violence. Dialectic violence connects site-specific direct and material violence to violence embedded in the social relationships and institution, institutions. This emphasis is not on things or events, but rather on processes and, and relations. So treating violence dialectically requires us to go beyond the dichotomy of structural and direct violence. So this allows us to think beyond the confines of the geographic features of the mine in Naga and then the subsequent violence that took place there. So death, dispossession and injuries. So in the Philippines, the judiciary is embedded in a set of institutional arrangements held together by legislation, the politicians elected uh, to create and implement law and by interest groups. So we can think of uh, national or resource nationalism as a way to think about the government uh, institutions in maintaining order and control of not just resources, but also other actors and communities or civil societies. To provide uh, a context to the Philippine legal system, it helps us to think of the Philippines as a multilingual post-colonial society. In the legal system, we see an interaction between the law and the human linguistic rights of individuals. Um, English remains the language of the law, and it remains the language of the educated at least elite as well, despite the fact that there are uh, 175 different languages over spread out over 7,000 islands. So lawyers litigate under the law and plead their casing, cases using a post-colonial language. So this is typical for post-colonial societies, 
uh, where the post-colonial language has become the administration, the language of administration, the law. At present, um, most Filipinos struggle to fully access the law and to make full use of their rights as citizens. And instead they rely on interpreters to access the court and the judiciary. Um, so this section uh, looks at uh, lived experiences uh, of mining affected residents in Naga City. So in 2019, as I mentioned earlier, I conducted over a dozen depth interviews with residents affected by mining and local and provincial government officials. I also documented the mining sites, a mining site and the surrounding area with a video camera and a drone. So I aim to illustrate in this section uh, who is invisible and what kind of violence they are experiencing. Um, so first is harassment. Harassment was experienced by residents uh, living in the area where mining takes place in Naga. Um, this harassment comes basically in two forms. Uh, at least two of the interviews, uh, interviewees uh, consistently received letters from the mining companies and governments urging them to relocate. Uh, and before and during uh, mining activities, mining companies uh, and armed police would be present at the site, which uh, the interviewees experienced as a form of intimidation. So for this presentation, I focus on the story of a former employee at the, who worked at the Naga city government. Um, the mining companies, Apo Land, uh, Apo Cement and Samex, alongside the Department of Environment and Natural Resources and the Mining and Geosciences Bureau became increasingly persistent. The interview we can, that I, the, the person that I interviewed continuously received letters of notice to relocate or vacate. So my interview also discusses her experiences of harassment when the mining companies, alongside government officials and police, had been harassing her to relocate and make way for mining activities. But she also specifically told me that they were armed with huge weapons. And. Uh, in the aftermath of the 2018 landslide, uh, resistance against mining appears to be fragmented along political lines. So since 2006, father and daughter Valdemir and Christine Chong have acted in tandem as mayor and vice mayor of Naga City. While loyal to the Chong family, one of my interviewees uh, lost her job when she started voicing opposition against mining uh, activities. When the mining company tried to pay her to relocate um, to make way for mining, threats and act of, acts of intimidation came her way. Eventually, she gave up and accepted the payment. So this is sort of typical of patron-client relationships in the Philippines, where corporate interests and politics um, come together. The person I interviewed told me that when it comes to projects and, mo and money, your loyalty will not matter anymore. Um, so considering the linguistic context of the law, uh, the legal interpretation that occurs in the court is a process that should be seen as one that imposes violence on others. The interpretation of law is one that includes justifications for violence which has already occurred or which is about to occur. So there are two key things that I have discussed uh, that shape my analysis of the primary court document in my research. So first is the linguistic dimension of the court, which narrows down on how we can look at the court as a site of institutional violence. Um, Second is comparing what the document says about the people who were affected by mining activities and the landslide. I also look at how mining affected residents or plaintiffs are made to appear in the document. So the court document that I have analyzed uh, is a document titled uh, the Temporary Protection Order or TIPO document, which is here on my screen. Um, so it's a document written in English and it articulates a series of events that happened leading up to the landslide on September 20, 2018. It also states who the plaintiffs and their lawyers consider responsible for damages. It summarizes, it summarizes the damages experienced by plaintiffs and what they demand from the defendants and the court. So the text is, uh, the document is produced by two law firms who work as a pro bono law, legal team representing the plaintiffs. Uh, in the document, the causes of action are fundamental. The specific section called causes of action are fundamental in articulating these claims and the demands from the affected residents according to the rule of law. So the first cause of action, for example, cited in this document outlines the mining company's grossly reckless and negligent conduct of its quarry operations. So this cause of action references Article 13 of the 1987 Constitution of the Philippines and is therefore grounded in a particular legal framework uh, that articulates specific legal categories. 
Um, so there are three things that I want to point out when it comes to the analysis of this document. First is the nature of questions of the judicial affidavits. The second is the issue of translation from Visaya to English. And the third is the issue of remission. So the judicial affidavits uh, presented to court include a mostly standardized set of questions asked to the plaintiffs of the case. So uh, these questions include a number of things you can see on my screen, which include, do you own land where, the house, where your house is built? Uh, where are you living now? How much is the value of your house? Um, so what we see here is that these questions evoke a particular set of answers from the plaintiffs. So in my, in my analysis, a pattern emerges from questions that seem to center around a few things, including how damages were experienced by affected residents. So next is the, uh, I want to point out the translations from the judicial affidavits that are contextually different when Isaiah is translated to English. Um, so on my screen, you can see a, see a few English and Bisaya words. Um, so uh, the Bisaya word for ask uh, verily uh, are pangayo or mangayo, while the Bisaya word for pray or prayer is ampo. However, in some of these questions and answers, these words are used intermittently in cases when neither the original question nor answer in Bisaya uses the word ampo. And yet it is still pray translated to prayer in English. So that's, that's the translation issue. The Bisaya language versions of the judicial affidavits do not, do not use the English or Bisaya word for prayer, which indicates how it interacts with the legal language required uh, in English. So then we have on my screen, you can see some excerpts of the judicial affidavits. And so what I want to point out here, for example, is that most monetary claims or damages in versions of the judicial affidavits in Bisaya apply English terminology. So for example, the word rental or attorney's fees are English words included in the Bisaya versions. So this points to the use of English to express damages in legal categories as, a, as opposed to expressing damages in Bisaya terms. So uh, then we have the problem of omission. So the court document shows the interaction between the professional and bureaucratic production of facts and lived actualities. Um, so the, the document is, a written, is, is written in a way that allows the transition from the actual into the institutional that can be fitted into categories that will enable charges to be brought against the defendants. So in this case, the lawyer has worked with the plaintiffs to turn their lived experiences into legal categories, into claims that can be identified in specific legal categories. So here it is helpful to think of specific legal categories that are references that, that are referenced um, in the court document that I've presented today. So uh, these three are the Philippine Constitution of 1987, specifically Article 7, Sections 2, 4, and 5, um, the Philippine Mining Act of 1995, uh, which references safety and environmental protection, and the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act of 2010, Section 19, which covers prohibited acts. Um, so, in conclusion, um, the comparison of lived experiences, as evident in my interviews and in the court document, shows how violence occurs when mining affected residents of Naga City participate in the judicial bureaucracy of Cebu. So, the participation, uh, this participation, can be seen as a type of, of resistance against mining companies and the state. While the claims that appear in the court documents, uh, document relate to material harm, there is also a type of violence that occurs in the bureaucracy when lived experiences are left out. So some of my interviews claim that they experienced harassment from mining companies, the police who showed up with guns, and they also experienced retaliation from the mayor. So this is not, however, included in the court document that I analyzed. So this points to the type of invisibility that I've attempted to, to sort of construct uh, in, this, um, in this presentation. So English, therefore, is an imposed colonial language that still dominates the judiciary. This limits participation of mining affected residents of Naga, whose first language is Cebuano, not English. So they rely, therefore, on lawyers and interpreters. So overall, English has been imposed on the Philippines as a construct of a colonized nation since the American colonial period. The contemporary judiciary continues to be a construct of an elitist social imaginary of Philippine society. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jake. I think I saw you present this before, and I think it's come some way since you presented it before. So great job. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I think you can unshare your screen. Yeah. yeah, there you go. And we do have another presenter coming right up, who is Sophie Eichelberger from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And her presentation is entitled From Fashion Magazine to Instagram, Innovation and Tradition and Contemporary Representation of Kimono. So Sophie, let's hear it. Okay, one moment as I get this pulled up. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, cool. Okay, so yes, um, as I just said, I'm Sophie Eichelberger from UNC Chapel Hill, and my presentation today is from Fashion Magazine to Street Style Instagram. Innovation and Tradition in Contemporary Kimono Representation. Here's a quick overview of what I'll be presenting today. I start with an introduction. What is kimono? What is its tradition in print mediums in Japan? And how has it been involved in modernization? Then I will move on to a specific case study I did of the fashion magazine Utsukushi Kimono to look at the models, the kimonos, and the backgrounds to argue that it upholds a false traditional image of what kimono and Japanese bodies should be. Then I will move to street style and look how the internet and constantly evolving technology has allowed for more innovation and um, changes in the kimono world. And then I'll conclude with why, we, why does this matter? Why do we care? And what is the role of technology? I wanna start with this quote from a kimono pattern book from 1688. What captures the hearts of the people are innovative, resplendent contemporary designs that retain classical Japanese aesthetics. Even in the early Edo period, you can see this push and pull between innovation and classical Japanese aesthetics. This is a theme that runs throughout this presentation. How do you maintain a Japanese look while also continuing to incorporate modern technologies? Some of the central questions that guide this presentation, how are kimono worn today? Why are they worn that way? And what does that mean about the bodies that wear them? And how does technology impact fashion? To begin with, what is kimono? As a term, it only dates to the Edo period, the late Edo period, and it literally translates as thing to wear. This isn't to say that the garment didn't exist beforehand, it just went by other names, such as kosode. While as the T shape of the kimono has changed very little over time, the fabrics involved, such as silk and cotton, as well as the technologies for printing, have continuously evolved and to create new styles. Additionally, there are many aspects of the garment. There's the robes themselves, the hair pieces, the obi, the underlayers, etc. The main takeaway is that this has never been a static garment. As you can see in this picture here from the early Edo period, this is a courtesan wearing a kimono that looks very little like what they are worn today, which is shows that both the bodies that wear kimono as well as the kimonos themselves have changed. Fashion magazines are also an integral part of the kimono industry. These images and books of kimono patterns have existed for a long time in Japan, dating back to the 17th century, with these hinagata bon or print magazines. As you can see, there are a couple of different styles of them, but the overall point is to make sure that women, particularly in Edo, but in Japan as well, can keep up with current trends. Woodblock printing in these books, like I said, are really crucial for the dissemination of kimono trends and pattern trends, which allows for a very sophisticated fashion system dating back to the Edo period. In today's world, as you can see in the top right picture, there are still kimono magazines. Like in the Edo period, there are many different ones that focus on different audiences. The largest takeaway is that the audience is Japanese women. So how do we go from the Edo period to today's kimono? Here are four key points that I've highlighted in the evolution of kimono. The first is the Meiji Restoration. Japan ends its period of closed borders and imposes a, the start of an era of self-westernization and modernization. 
In this period, you see the empress and her court wearing Victorian ball gowns. However, for the ordinary Japanese women and men as well, kimono is still the go-to garb for everyday life. This doesn't change until the 1930s and 40s when Japan goes to war. Because kimono has so much extra fabric with it, um, women were encouraged to either donate the silk of their kimono, these traditional heirlooms to the war effort, or to deconstruct them to make garments that didn't use as much extra fabric. This meant that after the war, many kimono were lost and with the American occup occupation, Western clothing was encouraged over the traditional Japanese clothing. This continues until the 1950s. And during this period, kimono becomes reserved for women of an upper class standing. Kimono becomes increasingly expensive and tied to traditional Japanese places and ceremonies, such as the tea ceremony and the coming of age ceremonies. Utsukushi Kimono is an important magazine because it was first published in 1953. So it's been a long running magazine and it highlights the trend that kimono was reserved for wealthy women with a focus on high-end kimono. This trend continues throughout the 20th century until the 1990s when there's a kimono revitalization. Women didn't have opportunities to wear the, their kimono and couldn't afford new ones. So they often donated their old kimonos to vintage stores and thrift shops where the younger generations were picking them up and wearing them as street style. Whether it's the traditional kosode of the Edo period or the modern kimono, Either way, there are two different positions about what the kimono is to Japan, either tradition or fashion. The first, as uh, Sheila Cliff argues, is that kimono is fashion. And here are the three points she highlights. First, she dismisses the claim that fashion is inherently Western. She traces Japanese fashion culture back to the Heian period, such as this dress on, or kimono on the left, which is a junishitoi, the thing that women wore in that period. As you can see, it's very different from today's kimono, but it was also very elaborate and had a fashion system around it. The second is the economic system necessary to support kimono fashion. This is a market economy, the technology to make the clothes, as well as a distribution system. The third is trends. In the Edo period, this was courtesans and actors leading trends and innovation, as we had seen in the kimono uh, print magazine from the period. On the other hand, kimono is also the traditional non-Western clothing that people in Japan wore before the Meiji period. Sheila Cliff in her book writes that traditional clothing is clothing that is relatively static, functioning to maintain customs and social order and valorizing the past. I argue that as a print source, utsukushi kimono through the nature motifs adorning the kimono, the references to traditional Japanese feminine activities, and the ambiguous backgrounds create a timeless artificial tradition of kimono and soft Japanese femininity. Here we have the first cover of Utsukushi Kimono. As I mentioned before, it's published in 1953. As you can see, the background is a vibrant magenta, which catches your eye. And the woman is wearing a mod kimono with bright colors, vibrant colors and geometric designs. This fits into the global fashion conversation of the time with mod fashions, the bright bold lip that you can also see in America and Europe. The audience from its inception has been wealthy middle-aged Japanese women, and in 2014, it claimed a circulation of 110,000. It is today the only large kimono magazine that is released quarterly. In the, in the 90s and the early 2000s, there were others, but with the uh, popularity of the internet, many of these print magazines moved to an online source because they didn't have to then front the cost of printing the magazines and there simply wasn't the readership available. So how does this magazine uphold a traditional false image of Japanese femininity? The first is the models themselves. Throughout this magazine, the models are all thin, very pale, have a specific East Asian look to them and are wearing makeup to enhance their natural features not to distract from the beauty of the women themselves. This, are, this shows what type of body that the magazine thinks should be wearing kimono and says by excluding other bodies that these are the only ones that should be wearing kimono. In addition, the backgrounds also add to this image of traditional false femininity. The first is that many women are shown walking through nature as you can see on the right. There's no buildings, there's hardly any pavement or anything to indicate that when this or where this photo is taken. 
The second is traditional feminine arts, such as ikebana or flower arrangement and the tea ceremony, as you can see in the middle. Again, this ties traditional Japanese clothing, traditional Japanese femininity to the body of the modern woman. The last is that there are many photos in front of buildings, such as the one on the left. However, even though this is a more modern building, there's glass windows and lighting inside, you still cannot tell when or where this photo is taken. This argues that kimono itself is a timeless garment that fits in in any background and scenery so long as there's no technology involved. In fact, the only picture of any technology in this magazine is a mother taking a picture of, with a digital camera of her daughter, which highlights again motherhood as a responsibility of Japanese women. The patterns are the last point I wanna highlight about how this magazine is creating femininity. These are very traditional motifs that you can see in kimono dating from a long time ago, such as nature, um, as well as fans, which are traditional Japanese as well. What you don't see, however, are any of the bright colors that we saw in the 1953 cover. In the Meiji era, it was really popular to have steamboats and to display really modern technologies and to show that Japan was evolving with the times, but none of that is seen on any of the kimonos that are printed today. The kimonos I just talked about are all, they're thousands of dollars. They're extremely expensive. And in response to that, there is this vintage kimono shop trend that is much more popular with the youth. Um, Lunko, an antique kimono shop owner, writes that when the first antique kimono boom happened, it was a reaction to the stuffiness of the former world of utsukushi kimono. So this is directly linking these two trends, that vintage kimono is in response to the world of utsukushi kimono. These kimono tend to be significantly cheaper, much more colorful because they're vintage and more popular with younger generations. Another incredibly important element is social media and street style. Uh, Hanami Yusugumi in Tokyo Street Style says that street fashion in Tokyo is always moving toward the next stage, the next thing, the next trend, the next experiment while honoring past traditions. So like the pattern book from 1688, we can see this tension between past traditions and the next thing. Milhopt in her book about modern kimono writes that an enthusiasm for conventional and unconventional modes of kimono dress has spread via social networks and other electronic media. She hits directly on the point that the internet and social media allows for faster translation of kimono and for faster trends to be set and changed. One of the ways that kimono changes is the way that it is actually worn on the models. As you can see on the left, she's actually wearing two kimonos in very unconventional ways. The middle model is wearing a kimono backwards and the one on the left, or on the right, excuse me, is incorporating Western elements such as jeans, and sneakers with a kimono that is left open. Uh, because street style, all you have to do is take a picture, post it to the internet and see what happens. If any of these more radical trends don't do well or perform well, the artist isn't out that much. Whereas for a magazine such as Utsukushi Kimono, they have to print these magazines, select the format, um, and there's a lot of cost involved with that. So if they do something this radical and it doesn't go over well, there's a lot bigger risk for them. Another important shift is the background. There are some models who take pictures in front of very traditional backgrounds, but then with very untraditional kimono, such as the picture on the left where she's wearing a very short kimono in front of a shrine. The other two go together, which is the trends between urban and techno-orientalism. Like the backgrounds we saw in Uskushi kimono, this urban background, you can't tell when or where this photo was taken. However, you do see signs of more regular life, such as the stickers and graffiti behind the model. This often is a scene throughout these Instagram photos that I was looking at where these large glass buildings, neon lights, sign of a modern techno-oriented Tokyo is featured in direct contrast with the traditional kimono to create a really interesting conversation about the two stereotypical images of Japan and Japanese culture. The last element I wanna hit on is the styling involved. It's much more experimental. It's fun with makeup. It's fun with hair styling, um, much more innovative. And it's also a queering of kimono. Whereas the women in Utsukushi kimono, they were all very feminine with the soft lighting. It was very coded that way. Street style allows for a larger expansion as to which bodies and which people are allowed to wear kimono. 
My conclusion is paper seems relatively simple at the surface, but it's something that a lot of experts have shied away from, which is to argue that kimono can be both traditional clothing and a fashion system. As you can see in the bottom left picture, that's Empress Masako wearing the Juni Hitoi, the Heian period garb on her coronation. By doing this, she's drawing on the long lineage Japan has as a fashion system, its technology and printing, and its cultural history. On the other hand, you have designers like Rei Kawakuba and Issei Miyake who are integrating new styles such as pleating or Western elements such as this kind of creepy doll um, into their fashion, which is just really pushing the boundaries of what kimono can be and what its relation with other fashion systems is. So yeah, my conclusion is that kimono is really complicated um, and it's both traditional and fashion. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And all of these papers were really, really interesting. Um, I don't think we have any questions that have been written in the chat. Does anybody want to start off with a question? I see Tasha has a question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Stir. I actually have a question for Sophie. Thank you for your presentation. It's really interesting. I'm also very interested in um, Japan and the kimono is also um, something that's very interesting where it's traditional and fashion, like you said. So I'm just wondering, I look at, for example, in South Korea, how the modernized hanbok or the traditional Korean wear um, kind of had this debate online between people saying that it's too modernized and changed too much and strays away from the traditional versus people who think that it's more of an aesthetic and fashion statement. So I was just wondering if you could enlighten me maybe and tell me what you think about what um, people in Japan are saying about these more modernized kimono online versus um, what, how people feel about them staying traditional. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And it's interesting because I think hanbok or even other traditional Chinese uh, garments have entered fashion very differently than kimono has. I think my perception of how altered kimono are is that Japanese, this is broad generalizations, but Japanese people tend to be excited when their culture is represented in the media, even if, or in the streets, wherever that is, regardless if it's not as correct as it ought to be. Um, I'm sure there's a very similar debate among, I would imagine it's older women, women who do the tea ceremony, who know how to wear these kimono correctly, because at this point, it's a skill that you're really only taught in specific kimono schools. Most women don't know how to put on a kimono correctly in their own house. So I don't, because the garment's so complicated, I don't think there's the same discourse around wearing it right, because most people don't know how to wear it right. Thanks, Sophie. Um, we're getting in the chat a bunch of questions for Sophie, which is um, kind of usual with the last panelists, but I do want to make sure that the other panelists also get questions. So I'm going to read this question from Tokikaki EE to Lillian. And this is, does the original Persona 4 question post-war show a high-speed economic growth or bubble period economy as the factors that left Inaka as being underdeveloped? Also, as you treat the game within a larger intellectual literary framework of the countryside, the trope of Furusato, um, is there any difference in the representation of Inaka in the game as compared to the one that appears in works such as of Miyazawa Kenji or any literary critics of the post-war modernization? Thanks so much. It was very re relevant to my own dissertation work that looks at cultural intersections among Inaka, modernity, and Tohoku. Yes, Toki, thank you so much for coming. Um, and thank you, of course, for <laughs> your questions. Um, they're very well sought out. Um, I was excited to see them in the chat. Um, so to start with the first one, um, Persona 4 doesn't really speak directly to kind of this Showa high-speed economic growth or the bubble period economy too much, um, which is really interesting now that I'm thinking about it. Um, I can't remember any instances was in kind of the script or the story of the game where kind of characters talk about it. Um, it seems to mostly focus on the city country dichotomy as opposed to reasons maybe why Inaba might be so kind of economically marginalized. 
Um, and then secondly, as for like kind of the differences in the representation of Enoch on the game, um, you know, and I noted, I briefly like nodded to the fact that this is like one of the things critics really tend to focus on, but I think it does have to do with kind of that sensitive treatment of characters who deal with kind of gender and sexuality, right? Um, because there does kind of seem to be this image of the countryside as backwards or conservative maybe. Um, so I think it's one of the unusual kind of interventions that Persona 4 makes to place these characters who are dealing with such maybe sensitive struggles within this environment. Um, but yeah, hopefully that maybe answers them a little bit. Um, I'm definitely going to steal these for future, re for future research. Thanks, Lillian. Um, and also Toki for asking the question. And then you have another one that I'll also read. And this is one for Sophie. Cool analysis. Are there any differences in representation of kimono and kimono models in magazine, magazines targeted for different audiences? For example, like in the representation presented in Ie no Hikari, a family mother-oriented magazine, as compared to An An or Non Non, both targeted for urban, urban single women. So he's he's throwing more magazines into your mix. <laughs> no, please put more magazines. Um, I don't know so much about magazines that don't focus specifically on kimono. There's this surprisingly large niche of kimono fashion magazines. And yes, in that genre, there are many different ones that target different audiences. The Skushi Kimono is like the stereotypical traditional magazine, um, which I chose in part because I had a physical copy of it and I didn't have any of the others. Um, but there is another one called Kimono no Hime, which is Kimono Princess, which is in contrast to Uskushi Kimono, it focuses much more on more hip, trying to get younger generations and young women interested in kimono instead of like your grandmother's kimono. So there is definitely a variation of the target audience for different kimono magazines. And that also, I mean, there are so many online forums now about kimono as well that whatever niche you're interested in, you can find it somewhere on the internet. Thanks, and we've got another question for you in the chat, Sophie. And um, this one is from Jake, and it says, if the kimono is both tradition and fashion, I am interested in the intersection between fashion as a mode of commercial production and tradition. How does this figure into fashion as an industry? Yeah, that's a great question. And one, <laughs> it was so easy for this project to spread in different directions that I didn't focus on the commercialization aspect. But one answer I can think of is, the introduction of synthetic materials as a way to lower the cost of kimono. So beforehand, you had to hand stitch the kimono together, take it apart to wash it. Silk is very expensive, which further limited who could buy kimono. But now there's so many polyester kimonos, cotton, yukata, that I think it has become more commercialized. It's easier, more accessible. But I also just think there's not a huge market for people who want to wear it. Um, so it's really interesting to see how popular it is still in these more fashion artistic ways, whereas you don't really see it on the streets that much. Thanks, I have a question following up on that. What about the popularity of yukata? Where does that fit into, um, your, is kimono high fashion by virtue of it not being yukata? And then where does the commercial aspect, is yukata like your production line and then um, kimono is like your high end? How does that work? That is an excellent question. Um, I would say, Yukata is still primarily worn, uh, much, many more young women and young men wear Yukata to summer festivals, mm -hmm. that sort of situation. Um, you do still have to like tie the obi for Yukata. You can wear like the shoes and the bag and all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, there's kind of, I think part of it is largely tied to the material. You would never buy a silk Yukata, um, <laughs> whereas you do buy cotton and other types of yukata, polyester yukata. Um, yeah, I think that's a good way to look. It's like kimono is like a suit or a ball gown, whereas yukata is jeans and a t-shirt. Um, yeah, I mean, kimono, I mean, they're thousands of dollars, like, unless you get them vintage, like to buy them new, whereas yukata is just not the same market at all. But it's, mm -hmm. yeah, good question. <laughs> 
Yeah, okay. I'm sure everybody else has lots of questions on this because it's our last one and it's, it's a very, very interesting topic, but I want to make sure that other people also get their questions. So I have a question for Friel. And this question is, you talk about how in Indonesia the policies were made, but um, in the making of the policy, does the shift between um, just shift to new order signal not only a different attitude towards um, cooperating with other nations, but also a different attitude toward technology? Yeah, it is a different attitude to technology because uh, during new order era, uh, Suharto government uh, emphasis on the economic development. So technology must be prioritized for industrialization and open the opportunity for, open the opportunity for foreign investment for example yeah okay 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 yeah thank you and um, i've got one for jake too and then we have one for lillian so my question for you jake and i can't remember if i actually asked this question to you the last time you presented um is so what counts as invisible depends on um, where you're looking from, right? Depends on your literal viewpoint. So in where are you located in the power hierarchy? So are you going to take that up in your analysis, especially since you say that it's dialectic? I would think that invisibility also would be something you could examine dialectically. So that's one question. And the other one is um, there's so much scholarship and so many ways you could go in like this is sort of Marxist, but it's not only Marxist. And um, there's so much that talks not about invisibility, but um, audibility instead or along with um, visual metaphors. So I'm wondering if any theory like like Rancière or even Foucault in terms of audibility is also informing your analysis. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so when I presented this last time, it was, it was in a class and it was sort of, uh, yeah, a different context, but no, that's a great question. And honestly, I'll, I'll just be the first to admit that I, I have a lot more work to do for this uh, research. Um, so this is leading up to my thesis uh, next year. But in terms of invisibility, I think it's a, it's a great point because I don't maybe I maybe didn't emphasize on it enough. The thing is that the invisibility that I speak of is not that it's not there. Mm -hmm. It's the emphasis that I'm putting on is that it's made to appear in a certain way or a way for it not to be included in the court. And also how the reason why I discuss legal categories is because the lived experiences have to match the existing legal categories. And for the sake, the attorneys who argued this case had to select the lived experiences that best suited the legal, legal categories that they deemed most winnable. So there, that, that, that is the, the process of selection is what makes it, it's sort of, it's not that it's not there, it's that there is a process of exclusion that renders certain things from a legal standpoint that documents this case study, renders it non-existing because it's not on paper. Um, and so there's definitely more um, um, theory for me to read, like you said, Foucault, um, there's also Farmer. I only now started going into Cover. Um, which is who analyzed or sort of uh, looked at interpretation in the, in the legal arena uh, way back in the 80s and sort of going as far back as that to the more more contemporary um, um, material. There's also an author called Tupas, a surname, the first name um, that sort of escapes me, but they all sort of look at linguistics in the court. Um, and that's an area that I want to specifically focus on in terms of um, uh, invisibility, uh, but also in terms of language politics. Yeah, great. Well, it sounds good. I look forward to seeing how it develops. And it's, not an, it's not an excuse. It's more recognition that 
I do acknowledge that there's a lot of gotcha. work for me to do. Yeah. <laughs> Makes total sense. We want to get Lillian's last question. In. This is a question from Tawanza Farmer, which says, did the addition of Persona 4 Golden correlate with a larger media trend to portray revitalization of the countryside? Are there any studies linking this media coverage to a boost in actual movements? Oh, very interesting question. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, there's a wonderful book, um, oh, I'm spacing on the author, but it's called Fukushima Fiction. Um, and, you know, I am coming at this from a literary background, right? Um, so, of course, I've mostly looked at literature as opposed to something like films. Um, but there's a large body of work that's done on both these connections between maybe the rise of nuclear discourse um, in literature, um, in film, etc. Um, like, of course, to the event and media coverage of the event, but also within fiction, like, and, you know, more maybe conventional fiction, such as novels or short stories um, and that type of thing. Um, I think that's maybe what you were asking. <laughs> Hopefully I've answered it, but. Thank you, everybody. We are at time. So I just want to say this has been a fantastic panel with so many different and interesting papers from multiple disciplines, multiple places, multiple backgrounds and Thank you so much for taking the time to prepare this and present this. And thanks everybody for all of your insightful questions. Yes, thank you everyone. And thank you so much, Dr. Stir, for being our moderator. Uh, great job to all the panelists in panel two. So we will now have a short 15 minute break before we move on to panel three, media technology across Asia. Thank you.